especially thanks to CAA and Michael and, and, um, uh, and Geraldine for allowing me to speak today. Uh, and I want to start off by uh, paraphrasing Box, as everyone should really, uh, because geospatial models are wrong. They're all wrong. What we need to know is how useful some of them are. Because the, some of them are very useful if they're focused in the right way. And I'm going to talk about mapping, and mapping as everyone knows is a representation of things. And it's never going to be perfect, but can it, can it represent what we need it to represent? And the bigger question in this session about uh, the problems that we face with it is, what if you don't actually know what they actually represent? Uh, so you've got to find what is to be represented before you can represent it. So, oh, it's going away, isn't it? It's just going for it. Hang on, let's... Uh, no, okay. Well, we've got a spinning globe there. Imagine that spinning around. Um, Sorry, maybe I'm stopping if, I, if you get rid of the point. Yeah, you get rid of the point altogether. Let's just go back and see if that can play again. That's better, doesn't it? As you, as you all know, since the last glacial maximum, um, sea levels has, have risen globally by up to 120 metres. The areas in red here cover the millions of square kilometres of terrestrial populated land that has been lost to us beneath the waves. In Europe, in the North Sea area, glaciers and ice packs two kilometres thick sat above Scandinavia and Northern Britain, making them quite inhospitable. But below that, Doggerland was fast becoming 120,000 square kilometres of low-lying, resource-intensive land with Riviera land and marine economies. Binford suggested that it could support tens of thousands of people in this area. And we have found around inland and coastal uh, sites typological similarities in implement crafting between Denmark, Netherlands, UK, especially in bone culture, demonstrating there was a cultural exchange across this area. In fact, what we may have is the cultural hub actually lost to us under this, uh, under this uh, lost land. So, when it comes to trying to get an idea of what this is all about, to understand the area, we first need to represent it in some way. And this is where our problems really begin. Firstly, in accessibility. I mean, obviously, it's underwater, which doesn't make it very easy to uh, excavate. Um, up to and above 100 metres of water covering it. But it's not just the water. There's also Holocene silts and sands and clays that have built up and have filled in features of the um, early Holocene landmass. This makes almost all remote sensing pretty tricky to work with. You can't, you can't really get much of a data set out of anything. Of course, you've got marine versus terrestrial. Now, geological uh, representations and bathymetry data are very well and good for modern activities, such as navigation for bathymetry. But it's of limited use if you're trying to investigate a terrestrial land that's been lost. And this is what we need to discover. Because we're not interested in just looking at the area that was the sea. We're looking at a continuous landmass that extends from Ireland in the west and the Mediterranean in the south, Eastern Europe. It's one landmass. There is no border there. Uh, and we have found, obviously, that scale is a hugely important thing. Because spatially, one is one thing. Geospatial analysis is a great analytical tool, so long as your question is appropriate to the scale. So you would never choose, if you're, choosing, if you're trying to find where the cultural hub 
was in the whole of Northwest Europe, you wouldn't want to just try and map a tiny little area and do analysis on that. You need to have the full range. But also, really important, is a temporal scale. And this is what uh, GIS is great for snapshotting. And you can choose as many snapshots as you want to, to demonstrate your, uh, your, how your world looked and to put layers upon layers upon it for analysis purposes. You can choose huge ranges, but you, they are still snapshots. It's not dynamic. You can't show that temporal flow of time in, in GIS. We've also got to think of the polo effect. Now, I'm not sure if you get polos in Germany, but uh, in Britain, they're a, a mint with a hole in the middle. And this is used because there is great evidence of Mesolithic uh, settlement, Mesolithic sites, Mesolithic implements have been found inland throughout the entirety of Northwest Europe and along modern coastlines. Norway, Sweden, Denmark, Germany, Netherlands, France, UK, all have their fair share of them. But there is nothing known about the middle. There is no contextual evidence there. And we're not seeing the picture. It's not that there is no evidence, there is no data. We know it's chock full. It's full of it, but we can't see it. And the lack of context is quite a major one. Uh, we have, in the mid middle of the North Sea, we have one flint in context. That, that is it. Everything else has come from serendipity, fishing, dredging. <clears throat> we know there's activity. There have been hundreds of finds, but we can't really pinpoint them to a place or to a time in, in, in exactitude. Um, obviously, there are some, some good examples of uh, coastal um, archaeology is going on, especially in Denmark and Norway, and the, the Rotterdam expansion in the Netherlands have been done brilliantly, but not in that central section of the North Sea. There are over 2,500 cores have been sunk in the North Sea, and out of those, less than 2% have been of any archaeological use whatsoever, because there is no focus, they've not been cored for archaeological purposes. Um, that is because it's all driven by industry and not by heritage. It's very difficult to get archaeologists. It's expensive work to go out there and do, and do work archaeologically. So we depend on industries, the, the, um, the energy companies, the uh, oil and gas industries, the aggregate dredging, the deep channel dredging, or fishing um, for our finds and for our knowledge, basically, of what's under there. And of course, the sea is a multiple border political, political zone. The North Sea and the Irish Sea combined have nine different nation states, all competing, all with their own motivations, making unified initiatives very, very difficult. And I, I think UK Brexit is not going to help matters, it's not going to improve matters at all in that way. Um, so, how do we deal with that area? How do we actually get any idea about it? I'm involved in an initiative called the Europe's Lost Frontiers Project. It's an ERC funded project uh, of 2.5 million euros, which use, is intending to use available seismic geophysics, which as you can see, cover quite a bit of the intended area. We're going to use it in a multidisciplinary in, in disciplinary investigation in order to identify and map paleolandscape features and Holocene horizons below the seabed. We're going to use those to initiate a co focused archaeological coring programme. Those cores can then be used to date to ground observe the, the seismics that we've taken. The cores will also undergo environmental analyses and investigate for SEDA DNA. My part of this, as well as doing the seismic uh, investigation and the coring programme, is also going to be in the computer-based visualisation aspect. 
where we will be attempting to map the entirety of the terrestrial North Sea. Okay, yeah, sounds like a bit of a, a, a big deal, but it's a super regional, the whole thing we're going to try and map. We're also going to try and identify features that may need some interaction and build voxel volume models of them so that it, we can use a visualization suite to get interactive virtual reality, get right in there with the detail of the individual things like uh, deltas or the, the riverine system, how it's changed um, into you know over over time since the uh, the glacial maximum, and of course the localized and the uh, temporal aspects we will have to use those uh, the, the the mapping so we've got a, an actual landscape we will then use those in uh, ABM in agent based modeling so that we can actually have some simulations over time and in a localized area. So, analyzing the landscapes. How on earth do we do that? Well, obviously, we have to acquire the seismic survey data. And we load that into a piece of software called IHS Kingdom. And each uh, survey line has to be examined individually because the available data come from 1960s all the way through to 2012 and from a number of different countries. We have to identify sedimental sequences and the reflectors uh, below the inundation line so that we can actually identify paleo channels, floodplains, hills, coastlines, etc. and find out where trans transgression actually took place. This then allows us to figure out great places for coring. So we can see here a, a survey line just off the coast of Norfolk. And at the bottom, we can see three coring locations. One on a shoreline, the second one, number 41, with a capped sequence going on there, all entirely capped in a transgressive sequence. And at the far side, a steep valley side. And we're using six meter cores, so we know we can get all the way down into that Holocene land base. And these, in this particular area, have proved so great that next month we're actually sending out a further survey to go into much more detail on the coastline piece down at the bottom there on that Paleo coastline. And when we get those cores, of course, they are um, taken back and put in forensic clean labs with dark lights uh, to avoid contamination. And lovely fetching paper suits, of course, if uh, like that, um, before undergoing analyses. Now, this isn't my area, but this is the kind of thing we'll be doing. The diatoms, coleoptera, pollen, um, uh, building up a, an idea of uh, landscape use and change over time. And also going into the sedimental DNA because DNA actually survives extremely well in cold salt water. In fact, temperature alone is thought to be the only taphonomic um, catalyst that, that results in decay. So they, can, they take each sample twice and you can see quite definitely the change between terrestrial and marine. You can see they actually go in for quite an uh, in-depth classification of taxonomy you won't be able to read that, but that's quite a, quite a, a breakdown, down to family level, um, including faunal DNA as well as uh, floral, which is very exciting. So, back to what I'm doing, I have to go on to the, uh, the point of mapping. And I think we all know probably how seismic works at sea, You've got a source and some receivers. What, I'm, what I've got to compete with is we have technologies from the 1960s all the way to 2012 uh, and from different countries and everyone uses different resolutions, everyone uses different technologies between high, um, high frequency chirper um, seismics to low frequency uh, boomers and we, in fact we mostly work with boomers because most of the data we receive comes from the oil and gas industries who are not at all interested in the top 
uh, the shallow uh, seismics. They want the deep down um, pockets there. Uh, and I, I work with various different bin sizes, uh, different resolutions, uh, and a different quality of data between uh, high definition and very, very low definition from the 1960s. But it can be done, and it's, it works really quite well. I mean, this is quite a high definition uh, uh, survey, but I mean, you can definitely see in there a Holocene floor line, you can see the transgression, you can even see uh, aggradation up the sides of the river, which are suggesting water, um, up the, the water table coming up, or fast flowing rivers actually uh, leaving up on the sides in a high, uh, maybe tidal period also, but yeah, up the sides, though no, it doesn't come in from one side, it doesn't come in from the other side, it's actually built up on both, which is very interesting to us. So what do we do with that? Well, we've got to take that 2D data and we've got to turn it into 2.5 data, that's what we like to call it. So depending on the proximity of the surrounding lines, you may need to um, implement a Hilbert's curve or maybe use bathymetry to interpolate in between the survey lines if you haven't got sufficient data in there. And you grid that. And once gridded, you can then calculate the depth from the time divided by half and apply a velocity model. Uh, it can be as simple, we've found in the north of the North Sea, that salinity and speed of sound through water and temperature are pretty much all you need because the Holocene land is outcropping on the ocean bottom there. But in the southern North Sea where you've got mobile sands and clays and peaks, you might need to also have an interfaces uh, aspect to your velocity model uh, so you can dictate different, different materials, how quickly it travels through different materials. Um, but uh, I must apologise, these are my early attempts at doing some of these uh, gridings for, for DEMS and stuff. And a lot of them have a lot of problems. As you can see up at the top there, that line is, that's a complete false line from a survey. But other than that, you can see that the orange lines are the bathymetry contours, and in, some, in most cases it follows them, but there are other areas which the bathymetry doesn't cater for, like this high rise here, which is not reflected in the contours of the bathymetry at all, um, we, we know to be higher uh, topographically than, than the lower. So there is difference, is, is what is important there. Um, and then, of course, we have 3D seismic, which is lovely because obviously you can just see, immediately you can see uh, features on the landscapes. Not only that, but you can bisect 2D survey lines um, that, that intersect each other, and you can move those over an actual feature to, to proof your, your horizons and to, to get a really good idea of what's going on in those levels. So here we see definite dendritic rivers and uh, a, a coastline, possibly a marine coastline going on. This And this is from the, the Dutch uh, Geological Survey. Um, uh, they uh, timed at 0.06 seconds, which is pretty good. In the, in the Southern North Sea, that's pretty much what we, what we expect for the Holocene uh, transgression. I also want to mention PGS. We have a contract with them uh, they're a large petrochemical and gas surveying company and they've supplied us with the Southern North Sea and this Northern North Sea. As you can see, that's not as filled out, we haven't quite got onto that yet. But all of that spine of data they've provided for us um, up to 0 0.5 seconds uh, amplitude so it can take us right back before the last glacial maximum. That's very, very useful and uh, we, we thank them for that. And their data looks a bit like that. You can see, you can definitely see uh, watersheds. You can see um, the migration of rivers over time. You can, you can definitely see the dendritic rivers on there. Um, quite exciting stuff, but you have to sit there and go through it quite carefully. So how do you map from 3D? Well, um, it's pretty much the same as the 2D, really, except that you use their bin as the, their grid bin for the actual, uh, the, the the gridding, so that you, you actually follow in their resolution. 
And then again, you grid it, you heal the curve if you need to, but the grids are pretty good, so you shouldn't need much interpolation there at all. And then you create your, your tin uh, or den from that. We also have the possibility of using HD 3D data. In some places marked in red, apart from this lovely one here, which we'd love to get hold of, but we can't, which is on the Dogger Bank itself. That's not available to us yet, but it will be come next year. The other red areas have overlays of HD 3D, which we haven't seen yet, but I think it will make an interesting uh, potential future work to compare and contrast and maybe combine the results of of all the, um, the 3D and 2D data and see what's around. Other future work, as was mentioned, was voxel modelling. I know nothing about this yet, but I might well get involved, so next year I'll be able to tell you all about this. It'll be beautiful. Um, but we have a visualisation centre for this. And of course we shall use those, uh, those dens as basis and landscape, which we then populate uh, with uh, layers for tree formation, uh, etc., for use in ABMs, uh, which, if anyone saw um, my colleague uh, Michael Butler's presentation on ABM the, uh, on Tuesday, they will know it will contain trees. So uh, that's, that's it, really. That's all I've got to say. So who we are, this is all the different organisations that are involved in the project. Uh, so I just would like to say... Thank you very much, and um, any questions?